Uh, today we're meeting with Dr. Masri. Now, Dr. Masri is a board certified plastic surgeon who has been practicing medicine in South Florida for almost 20 years. His surgical skills are derived from his comprehensive training in both general and plastic surgery. He has a rare distinction of holding dual certifications from both the American Board of Plastic Surgery and the American Board of Surgery. He is also a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Masri, thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we're going to talk today about breast reduction and, and, and more in general, the general common practices of, of, of breast reduction. Um, uh, first of all, I'm sure our audience has, has some questions about uh, your history. And uh, uh, just start with, you know, how many breast reductions uh, do you typically do in a week? And, and how many have you done over your career? I would say that uh, breast reduction procedure is something that we, uh, is probably one of the most popular procedures of our practice. Uh, over the years, I've had extensive experience with breast reduction, uh, extending from my residency on to now in my, my, my professional practice. Uh, I would say in a, a regular week, we could probably do uh, four breast reductions pretty easily. But for the most part, I would say the range of breast reductions really it just depends on everything from the time of the year to uh, you know what's coming in the door. But most cases, it's about anywhere from 25 to 100 breast reductions a year, and over my experience, I've probably done over a thousand. Hmm. Uh, and Dr. Masri, who would be a typical candidate for breast reduction, and, and what, what makes somebody a good candidate uh, for that? And, and obviously, are there some people that just it wouldn't work for? Maybe you could elaborate on that as well. well most people who present for breast reductions are people who are usually uh, symptomatic. Uh, large breasts can create a lot of discomfort and pain, uh, typically around the shoulders, around the neck. It's also responsible for a lot of irritation underneath the, the skin on the lower parts of the breast. Uh, the requirement to wear very constricting uh, tight bras is also uh, a, a, a a problem with women with uh, large breasts. So by and large, most women who present with uh, complaints of large breasts have other associated symptoms. And in most cases, it's not all just a, a cosmetic consideration. It's more of a functional consideration. And, and what's the recovery like? Um, recovery from breast reduction surgery is I think relatively straightforward. Most women experience a little discomfort immediately post-operatively, but the recovery is, is in most cases about a week. Hmm. And, and uh, what's the general goal of breast reduction? Uh, you know, would a, uh, uh, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and I should also mention a, a common question that comes in is, would a bra still be required uh, immediately or even long-term? I think the, the, the goal of breast reduction surgery is to alleviate some of the symptomatology related to large breasts. In the breast reduction procedure, we remove skin and breast tissue to decrease the volume of the breast. And by decreasing the volume of the breast, we're also able to improve the shape of the breast and improve the location and the relationship of the nipple areolar complex to the, the, the relationship of that to the, the breast itself. Now, by doing this procedure, we effectively lift the breast. So we lift the breast, we're improving shape of the breast, and we're also improving the projection of the breast. So these are all the, the goals of the procedure that really bras are used to emulate. Bras are used to create all of those uh, characteristics of a breast. So having the breast reduction procedure doesn't necessarily mean that you can go without a bra, but I think that in most cases, the supportive features necessary uh, or that bras are used for are 
and somewhat eliminated from having a breast reduction. Now, a lot of variables are, are, are necessary to decide whether or not you still need a bra or you would still need to wear a bra after a reduction. And I think that's primarily just a, a matter of personal preference. Mm -hmm. And it's also related to uh, a lot of the, the amount of breast tissue that's been removed, the size reduction essentially related to the procedure. So, so Dr. Masri, uh, do you have to do this in a hospital or, or where do you perform this surgery? It really depends. Uh, a lot of uh, factors are considered. The their overall medical condition is a very important consideration. There are breast reductions that can be done or, or performed in an office setting without a problem. However, most people who present with um, for breast reduction surgery really, in my opinion, require a hospital setting only in the sense that it has to be done under general anesthesia. Uh, in doing so, general anesthesia, some people postoperatively have problems related to nausea, vomiting. They may have some discomfort that's just not alleviated with uh, simple oral medications, may require some IV medication. So in some cases, again, we take this on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, People may require overnight hospitalization, but most of our procedures are done in the hospital. I think that there is a certain safety index related to having procedures performed in the hospital. Typically procedures that require removing large amounts of tissue and um, that may or may not be uncomfortable postoperatively. And and so now that we're in a hospital, uh, what about uh, covering the cost? I mean, will insurance cover the procedure? In most cases, breast reduction surgery is covered by insurance. Hmm. Now, this depends on the insurance companies and the policies related you know, to uh, this coverage. However, based on the symptomatology of uh, patients presenting for this procedure, Insurance companies, uh, there, there are criteria related to medical necessity, which insurance companies uh, do request. And obviously, people with symptoms related to large pendulous breasts do qualify as medical necessity. The, the authorization process is something that um, we have a lot of experience in, but insurance changes you know, every month insurance companies make new decisions, but we work with patients and insurance companies to try to uh, make sure that if your policy does provide coverage for this procedure, that we definitely do it through the insurance. Mm. Uh, so, Dr. Masri, uh, getting to maybe a little bit more about shape and time. Um, so, if, uh, if if there's weight gain or weight loss, um, what will happen to the uh, the shape and size of the breast? Will it actually uh, grow and shrink um, uh, according to uh, you know personal uh, uh, shape of the body? Well, yes, it will. In in as we age our breast volume gets replaced, our breast tissue gets replaced with fatty tissue. And that fatty tissue is uh, des uh, definitely sensitive to the, the, the effects of, of weight loss and weight gain. So for example, a woman with large breasts in her 40s who has gained uh, a lot of weight will find that that weight distribution is probably going to go, uh, you know, to a certain percentage in her breasts. Now, in the same patient with weight loss, she'll probably see a significant weight loss from her breasts as well. That I really believe that it it in it's more of an age-related phenomenon, and certainly the issues related to weight loss and weight gain do play in the. Um, the, the cosmesis of a, a breast reduction postoperatively. Mm, okay. Uh, so what, what about situations where uh, a patient uh, plans to have children uh, and they want to nurse a baby? What happens after the procedure in, in a situation like that? That's a very common question. And the, the way that I answer that question 
is more related to the fact that when you're doing this procedure, you're not affecting the ducts on the nipple area order complex that uh, provide milk to the baby. Now, you're reducing the volume of breast tissue that ultimately leads into those ducts that provide the milk to the baby. But the real issue is, is that functionally, you should be able to breastfeed. However, in some cases, you are unable to produce enough milk to satisfy the baby. There have been studies to show that uh, women overall who have any type of breast uh, procedure, whether it's a reduction, whether it's an augmentation, or whether it's just a breast lift, uh, statistically, and they've done studies on this, uh, just choose not to, for personal reasons, uh, breastfeed. Mm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't physiologically breastfeed. And uh, for the screening purposes of, of breast cancer, for example, um, uh, is it more difficult to detect um, uh, masses uh, after a, a procedure like this? The procedure is, in most cases, done on women um, over the age of 35. Now, certainly there's a younger population who have breast cancer, uh, who have breast uh, reductions. However, for women who are closer to the uh, age of 40, we always uh, request a preoperative screening mammogram. The recommendations, depending on your your personal family issues or your personal is, uh, history of, uh, of any breast ailments, usually dictates this, but in most cases, we request that you have a screening mammogram if you're around the age of 40, just to have a baseline. Now, if for whatever reason, after surgery, there's a question of palpable masses or something uh, suspicious on mammogram, there's always a baseline where there's always a reference from that preoperative screening mammogram. Now, just having a breast reduction in and of itself does not mean that uh, there is a possibility of changing the architecture of the breast such that a mass is not detectable by radiographic studies. It, what it does mean is only that if there is anything suspicious on mammogram that uh, in this day and age uh, radiologists and uh, uh, breast surgeons are very aggressive about performing additional studies, but that's whether you had a uh, a breast reduction or you 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 had any or or nothing done. It's just in, in this day and age, if there are suspicious findings on a breast exam, that they can be evaluated in a number of different ways. So it shouldn't be a concern. Oh, that 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 clarifies that point very well. Um, so what about risks? Um, uh, what kinds of things can go wrong, and what are some of the preemptive strap or the pre preparing steps in order to re reduce, let's say, for the, the risk of infection or w what have you? Uh, can you maybe elaborate a bit on that? Yes, I think those are very important considerations, and that's why preemptively we really assess your uh, past medical history, your past surgical history. Some uh, complications typically occur with people who are not um, basically at their, their um, peak medical status. I would say that the biggest concerns for me are people who smoke. Uh, smokers run a higher risk of developing wound infections. They run a higher risk of what we call wound dehiscence where the, the skin that we brought together opens up a little bit. There's also considerations related to the um, nipple areolar complex. Smokers have a higher incidence of what we call necrosis, which that nipple areolar complex, the tissue of that nipple, nipple areolar complex, which is so dependent on uh, blood supply from uh, some certain elements of the breast tissue, are compromised and um, those are big considerations. But in terms of wound healing, we watch for people who are diabetics. 
who are poorly controlled diabetics, I might add. Normal uh, diabetes with good control is really not a contraindication to having the surgery. The biggest contraindication, I would say, is smoking. And we really encourage people who come in for evaluation to stop smoking for at least six weeks prior to surgery. Otherwise, uh, from the full range of young women uh, requesting breast reduction and surgery to older women um, just tired of carrying around the weight, uh, we, we do a, a careful analysis and of course we make sure that we are in contact with their uh, primary doctors, their internal medicines, to make men medicine doctor just to make sure that there's, there's nothing that we have to be concerned about, overly concerned about in terms of, of recovery. Now, uh, aside from issues related to potential infections, there are always uh, risks about, uh, and I wouldn't say that these are risks, but there are always considerations about how well people scar and the areas in which they scar. Sometimes um, women may uh, are tend to develop what we call hypertrophic scarring, which is um, scarring that's a little spread uh, or, or more spread than it was following the surgery. And sometimes there are women um, who are predisposed to what we call keloid scarring, which are, are very raised and painful and can be painful. Um, these scars are problematic, but there are certain things that we can do to try to prevent and, and, and post-operatively we can try to treat them using different modalities. The uh, one thing that I do want to mention, and this is a question that's very common when, when young women present to the offices, does the procedure affect sensation to my nipple areola complex and uh, will that be altered? And the answer to that question is uh, a straight out yes, maybe. However, that change in sensation usually resolves or comes back to a baseline anywhere from six months to a year after surgery if it happens. I would say in my experience that I've, I've seen that in probably about 10 to 15 percent of women have a situation where they experience insensate uh, nipples following surgery. But uh, in most cases, that returns. It may not, if it does happen, again, it's a rare occurrence, but if it does happen, it may not return to 100 percent, but maybe to about 80 percent. Got it. So, uh, so kind of summing up here, uh, we'll, we'll look a little bit at some, uh, some of the obviously the fears that people have. Um, what uh, what if this procedure doesn't meet reasonable expectations? And I, I mean reasonable. I mean, uh, you know, what someone would would normally see in a person's inconsistencies in their body, for example. Um, you know, for example, what if one one breast is slightly higher or larger than the other? Uh, what what do you have to say about that? There are always procedures that we can do to treat issues related to asymmetry postoperatively. In a lot of cases, it's very difficult to gauge how well the tissues are going to uh, readjust to their new positions, how well uh, patients are going to scar following the procedures. But I think more importantly, uh, it really needs to be evaluated or issues related to potential asymmetry, potential uh, aesthetically displeasing scars, all of those issues are something that uh, we address about six months to a, a year after surgery. But those are definitely issues that can be addressed and in most cases they can be addressed with very minor revisions. I would say that 85 percent of uh, situations like that are something that can, can be done under local anesthesia in the office and really have a little to no downtime. Um, the, the big, I think one of the big concerns is, um, you know, if I have a procedure and, you know, it's not to my liking, um, you know, what can be done about it? in terms of, more in terms of volume. I find that women who have very large breasts are very eager to have very small breasts. But it's a very important consideration 
with a woman who's had large breasts for you know 20 years of her life to all of a sudden wake up one day and not be able to see that she has the same type of volume or breast tissue that she had before. So I think it's very important that we counsel our uh, clients very carefully on what it is that the breast reduction is going to accomplish. Overall, uh, it's very important to understand as well that in all of plastic surgery, every procedure that we do, from facelifts to neck lifts to tummy tugs from, to liposuction, studies have shown, and these aren't our studies, but these are actual scientific studies that have been published, in all of plastic surgery, breast reduction procedures provide the highest satisfaction ratings to people who have them. And, and that really goes without uh, saying, when you see a woman who's complained so long for having neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, um, irritating bra strap injuries, uh, superficial skin infections related to these large pendulous breasts, um, th those people following breast reduction surgery are very, very happy to get rid of a lot of these problems. And it becomes a situation that it's not only a, a, a functional improvement in their lifestyles, but they're always very, very happy um, with an aesthetic improvement of, their, of their, uh, their breasts and the way that they're able to wear their clothes better and they're able to find clothes that fit. That's a, a very common um, phrase that uh, after breast reduction is that, oh, wow, now I can uh, buy clothes that fit. So now I'm going to spend a lot more uh, money than I thought I was initially. So, <laughs> it, but it's, uh, I, I think breast reduction surgery, and I've seen it just based on the number of breast reductions I've been involved with over the years, it is the, um, it is the most satisfying and rewarding procedure, not only for myself, but for the patients who have the procedure. So uh, kind of in summary, uh, is there anything that uh, a patient uh, needs to do or needs to know uh, to prepare for this? And, and maybe, you know, as a closing comment, maybe offer your suggestions um, to a would-be patient. I think uh, preparation for uh, breast reduction isn't something that happens overnight. I think that there's a lot of psychological preparation involved. And again, that relates back to what I mentioned previously about the fact that you here you're looking at yourself a certain way, you're buying clothes a certain way, you're buying bras a certain way, and then the next day that's completely changed. Most people who come into the office for a breast reduction procedure trying to find out more information about breast re reduction procedures already know from somebody who's had it done before, a relative or a friend who've had, who's had it done before. So they kind of know of the experience. I think the, um, the important thing in terms of preparation is when you're, when you're, when you're discussing uh, possible breast reduction with your doctor, you want to make sure that um, it's something that you're really looking to um, I don't want to say looking to improve your life, but you want to make sure that it's something that uh, you've decided that there's no other way to deal with your uh, large breast issue. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's certainly, we, we talked about how weight loss and weight gain affect your, your breasts. Um, if you're looking to have a breast reduction to lose weight, Certainly, you are going to lose weight from the procedure, but um, if you come in with large breasts and you've progressively gained weight over the last five years, uh, one of my comments is, is typically, well, uh, how would your breasts look if you lost 10, 20 pounds? Uh, do they look any different? And oftentimes, I see somebody who looks at me and says, well, you know what? I don't know. That could be something. So. There is no replacement for, for, for a good balanced diet, um, diet and exercise. And if, if you are in, uh, if you are in your, I'm not going to say your best health, but if you were in a healthy situation and you still have uh, large symptomatic breasts, 
then it's definitely something to consider. Well, Dr. Masri, as always, it's great having you on the show explaining uh, uh, and, and demystifying a lot of the topics related to um, uh, cosmetic surgery. Uh, thank you once again for, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. appreciate the opportunity. Mm-hmm.